from the conference to give the official introduction to Pastor Anthony Farrell. Have you been blessed? Yes. Man, God has been here. A wonderful story for the kids, admonition to be faithful. Thank you for singing. I want to welcome each one of you together. Let me introduce myself, although I have been with your board several times. My name is Rodney Mills. I am the Executive Secretary, VP for Administration, whatever you want to call me. Um, I am the person that has been helping to navigate the waters of the pastoral transition process. Today we're here because the conference believes that while the journey has been circuitous and some may feel, Aaron, too long, <laughs> um, while the journey has been, now we are at the point where we are feeling as though maybe God is calling Anthony Burrell to be your pastor. Anthony um, grew up a son of a Baptist minister. Uh, when I found that out, I thought, well, that can't be all that bad. My wife was a Baptist. <laughs> the granddaughter of a, her grandfather was a Baptist minister, so got to be something good there. About the age of 20, he learned the Seventh-day Adventist message and for a little while worked in um, Lansing, Michigan, there by East Lansing, by Michigan State University, but then felt the call to go to Southern Adventist University to study theology. It used to be called SMC, Southern Missionary College, but others of us called it Southern Matrimony College. And while God led him to Southern to study theology, he was sidetracked in his studies as he studied Avery. <laughs> in 2016, Avery and Anthony committed their lives together in ministry. And for two years, the past two years, they have been ministering in the Mountain View Conference there in West Virginia. They have two lovely children, Zion, who's four, and Zipporah, who will be two on Monday? On Monday. I ask, Anthony, what is, if you could summarize your ministry in one sentence. What is the passion for your ministry? And after some time, he thought it through and says, equipping local churches. Maybe you meant by that congregations, because I'm not sure the building can do much. <laughs> equipping local congregations to carry out the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ is expressed in the three angels' messages to their part of the world. Today, Anthony is here interviewing you. <laughs> the board has had uh, extensive time talking with him, interviewing him, and now it's Anthony's turn to see if he wants to come. Today, um, as he, he will preach, and then there will be opportunity for you to get to know him. Make sure you have the right foot going forward, you know, the good one. Seriously, we want, we want you to see the congregation. There will be some time afterwards, um, after the church service, assuming that Anthony doesn't preach for two hours. Um, there'll be some time for you to meet him, 
get to know him and Avery and the children. Then we're going to be having a time of potluck, picnic, wherever you choose, whatever you choose. Hope you brought a lunch. If not, we'll have a day of fasting. Um, at about 2.15, we'd like to come back together here as a district because while the conference feels as though this is a really good match, we don't want it to be a shotgun wedding. And so we'd like to hear from you as a district, what are your indications what are your thoughts what what kind of suggestions hopes dreams and desires might you have that the conference would express to Anthony and Avery they won't now they will not be here for the 215 meeting um, that'll be just family time here as we share and then I'll be having another conversation with them after that but Anthony on behalf of the Upper Columbia Conference, we are glad you are here. And personally, I hope this is one of many, 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 <laughs> many times that you'll be occupying this pulpit. Amen. 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 Thank you, Elder Mills. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Happy Sabbath to everyone. You know, Long sermons are going out of style, but the thought process is that if I can just keep the sermon going until Jesus comes and we're all in here, then there's a good chance we'll be ready. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But I am glad to have you all here. Amen. I'm so glad that you all are so excited about being gathered together uh, on this high Sabbath as one district. Um, you all look very good. It's exciting. Uh, to be here, and, you know, maybe there's some providential indication that going forward in the future, we have to kind of make a routine, high district Sabbath, something a part of our life together um, as a church. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Man, God is good. The Northwest is beautiful. What I've seen of it so far. This is my first time in the state of Washington. Prior to this, I've been to the West Coast one time, and that was a little while ago, and so I am happy with what I've seen. My wife is happy, so I'm even more happy. <laughs> this is, I, I'll be honest, uh, Elder Mills, I feel like I'm getting spoiled here, so, uh, but God is good, and he's good to his children, and I'm just excited to gather uh, with you and have this opportunity to worship with you. Um, with God's help, I just want to speak to you on the subject today, praising God in a pandemic. And I invite you to pray with me. We're going to seek God once more, just that he will help us to hear and listen to him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, in Jesus' name we come unto you. And only ever in his name, for he is our source of power, strength, life, health, and all things. What a privilege it is to be gathered in your house on your day with your people. And that you will speak your word unto us. Father, we know that you are speaking all throughout our lives. And as we grow and as we draw nearer to Christ, we learn how to hear and discern your voice better. But I still believe that. In the corporate worship, you speak to your people unitedly in a special way. You taught us while you were on earth that our heart is like soil that receives seed. Holy Spirit, please prepare the soil to hear the word that you have for your people today. And I'm praying that amongst the faces I see, there are hearts of good soil that will receive the word with joy and hold on to it. And that as we exercise faith, we will bear fruit, some 30, some 60, and even by your grace, even a hundredfold. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, talking to some of my friends back in West Virginia and sharing with them that 
there's a high likelihood that I'll be moving to the state of Washington, I was surprised that one of the comments that I got from uh, some of my associates was, oh man, you're thinking about going to the Northwest? I hear that everybody out there is depressed because they don't get enough sunlight. <laughs> Praise God, the sun is shining today, amen? amen? And I've only met cheerful people so far, so I'm going to thank God for that. But I did read because I was curious, and I did look up some information, and I found that the Washington State Health Assessment did find that one in three Washington 10th graders suffers from depression. They reported experiencing strongly depressive feelings and extended periods of sadness and hopelessness. It made me think about how even outside of the state of Washington on the world scene, during this COVID-19 pandemic, another pandemic has been brought to light. That is the mental health pandemic. Extended periods of lockdowns, quarantines, and social distancing have produced increased rates of depression, increased rates of suicide, alcoholism, drug abuse, even sexual abuse has increased during this time, and it's truly a sad state of affairs. I know that even Christians who worship the living God, those who make up the wonderful body of Christ, even at times, we have to wrestle against depressive thoughts and feelings. We have to fight the battle against negativity. To remain positive, to remain aware of the truth of the God we serve, and to remain connected to him. So it seemed good to me today to share with you, to remind us of the many reasons that we have to praise the living God and to maintain a mindset of hopefulness, a mindset of positivity. We're going to be reading today in Peter's first letter. If you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and find our way to Peter's first letter. That one is close to the back of the book. By the way, being the son of a Baptist minister was not a bad thing. And my running joke with my parents, I'm not sure that they find it funny yet, my running joke is that it's their fault that I'm an Adventist. Because I grew up in a good Baptist home where our watchword was, the Bible says it. That settles it. We ought to believe it. So what was I to do when I came into contact with the Advent faith and message? I had no other choice, as it seemed to me. Reading in the Apostle Peter, we see today that he wrote to a group of people that had plenty of reasons to be depressed. He says in verse 1, to the pilgrims of the dispersion. Easy words to read over in an introduction to a letter. But what Peter is telling us is that he's writing to people who are exiled. We think of the word pilgrim and we think of somebody that's traveling. But what the Bible is telling us is that as the people of God, we are strangers. We are traveling through this world largely because we're rejected by this world. He's just highlighting the fact that when one gives themselves to Christ, they are beginning a journey of becoming ever and ever more unlike the world and ever and ever more unacceptable to the world. So he acknowledged them as being exiles. You'll read in the English Standard Version, pilgrims or strangers in other versions. They had reasons to be sad. It's hard to be in any place for an extended period of time where you don't feel at home, where you know you're not accepted, not appreciated, not wanted. So Peter understood he was writing to pilgrims. He also mentioned that they were scattered because they were pilgrims of the dispersion. We talk about the Jewish diaspora who, in the time of persecution in the early church, they were scattered throughout all the nations. And we thank God for that because that's how the gospel went everywhere. 
But being scattered, being sent away from home, being distanced for a prolonged period of time from those you love and those you know can be depressing. So they had plenty of reasons to be sad. When you're not just far from the people you know, but when you're far from the surroundings you know. When you're far from the customs and the traditions and the society that you know in a new place, in an unfamiliar place. This was the life of the Christians to whom Peter writes. And it's true that in our lives today, we can always find another reason to be upset, to be sad, something negative to focus on. But what I want to show you today is that it's to this group of people, it's to this group of people when we move down to verse 3 that Peter writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That word blessed is, is Peter saying God is worthy to be praised. He's saying in spite of the most unfavorable circumstances, God is still worthy of our praise. And in our text today, he goes on to outline the blessings, the benefits that are attached to experiencing salvation in Jesus Christ. Wasn't it the psalmist who wrote, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Amen. What I want to say to you today is that if the early Christians could enjoy God in exile, then we can praise God in the pandemic. Amen? Now, why is that? Because as we read, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. He has begotten us again. You might render that phrase, he has caused us to be born again. For he has given us new life in Jesus Christ. So we can praise God in a pandemic because if you trust in Jesus today, then you can praise God for giving you new life in Jesus Christ. So let's read that text again, beginning in verse 3. And let God unpack to us the heavenly realities of our salvation that should cause us to experience joy, praise, no matter what our life may be taking us through. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith, for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. We can praise God for this new life he's given us. Because I see here that our new life, our new life comes to us through the plan of salvation that existed in the heart of God, the Father, from all eternity. We know that God is our Father. Jesus taught him taught us to address him as our father. But but this text tells us something else. This text refers to God as the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why is Peter telling us this? He's emphasizing to us that God the father is the supreme orchestrator of the plan of redemption. We praise Jesus Christ. We think of him often. We see him as the central figure of our salvation. He lived, he died, he rose again. But let's not forget the Father. Because when we look at the Father and his glory and his wisdom, we see that our salvation is not an afterthought. But our salvation is indeed the working out of God's eternal plan for his glory. 
and our ultimate good. You see, Jesus teaches us this in John chapter 6 and verse 37. He says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. So if you have come to Jesus, it's because the Father led you to him. When the gospel is presented, often God the Father is pushed to the side. He fades into the background of our thoughts. But in Jesus' teaching, God is the primary mover in our salvation. He's the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In saving us, Jesus says, again in John 6, I have come down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. So Jesus, in saving us, is doing exactly what his Father wanted him to do. So we should praise him? You see in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, the Bible says that God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. This is God's plan for us to live forever in his eternal kingdom. Thank you, Pastor, for sharing that Sabbath school and giving us time to reflect upon what it is that we desire to participate in when we get to the new earth. Thank you. But let us remember it's the Father who wants us there. You see, before Genesis 1, verse 1, where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, God chose to save everyone who would believe in his son, Jesus Christ. This is God's choice. Ephesians 3, verse 11, lets us know that the plan of salvation is God's eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Jesus our Lord. God is saving us. We can praise God the Father. What higher impetus for joyfulness and hope can one have than to know that our salvation is the very heart of God the Father? The Bible takes us far beyond what we as humans can comprehend, and we just ultimately have to humble ourselves before God and thank Him when we read verses like 2 Timothy 1, verse 9. It says, God has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our own works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Grace given to us before time began. Can you understand that? I can't, but I can say thank you, God. And very similarly in Titus 1 and verse 2, we see that through trusting in Jesus, we have the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Our salvation was not an afterthought. God is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the primary mover, the supreme orchestrator behind our salvation. That's why it's so silly when we get this idea in our head that we have to do something to better ourselves before we come to Jesus. Not realizing the grace was given us in Jesus before time even began. And what we must do is come to him as soon as we recognize his drawing voice and allow him to do the work of saving us. As we continue to read in this text, we see that, that we can praise God in a pandemic for this new life because our new life comes from God's overflowing mercy. The text says that God has begotten us again according to his abundant mercy. More than necessary, more than is conceivable, it's abundant. The idea is of a fountain or a spring that flows and flows unceasingly without end. You see, people often say when explaining the gospel that grace is God giving us salvation which we don't deserve. That mercy is God withholding from us eternal punishment that we do deserve. And I agree with that, 
But, but it's, it's more than that. When you see these ideas of grace and mercy brought out in the scripture talking about the character of God, it's telling us that grace is the heart of our salvation. Grace is the heart of God. It's a disposition to be kind to people that don't deserve it, that have done nothing to, to prompt you to be nice to them. Loving the unlovable. That's grace. It's the heart of our salvation. And when you see this beautiful word mercy, mercy is like the hands and feet of salvation that puts grace into action in saving us from our sin. Born again according to God's abundant mercy. And the Holy Spirit is telling us we have to learn to allow our minds to be drawn up to these truths away from the scenes of earth, which can often be so depressing. We can praise God in a pandemic for the new life we have in Jesus Christ, because as we continue to read, we see that our new life brings new hope. Can you say amen? I like what Peter says. God has begotten us again unto a living hope. Let me hear you say living hope. You see, I'm interviewing you today. Thank you, Elder Mills. I didn't know that. Now I do. I was raised in a black Baptist church. It's all right to say amen. It's all right to talk to the preacher. I like to interact. We're born again to a living hope. And, and, and we must understand today that when we talk about biblical hope, we're not talking about wishful thinking. We're not just talking about positive thinking. Maybe you've heard of, you know, books like The Power of Positive Thinking. We're not just talking about that. We're not just talking about a desire like, I wish it would do this. I hope it does not rain. I hope that I, that's not biblical hope. Biblical hope is being confident in what God has promised and boldly expecting God to fulfill his promises. Confidence and expectation. Hope brings with it a certainty. That's why Paul brings out that this is among the three highest Christian virtues. Now remain these three, faith and what? Hope and love. And we know that the greatest of these is love, but hope is right there, supporting our love. Maybe you've been discouraged as you walk the narrow path of following Jesus. You've been beat up by difficulties. You've tripped. You've fallen. You've wandered. You've strayed. And sometimes if we're honest with ourselves, we just outright step off the path. You and I, we've yielded to temptation. And you believe in Jesus' promise of forgiveness. But you look at yourself, and, the, and many times the fruit of growing up in Christ and maturing in Christian character, you feel is sadly lacking in your life. Maybe you still carry around shameful habits that compromise your Christian witness. Maybe you feel insecure that you're not as lively and active in sharing the faith as you ought to be. Can you have hope? Yes. Can you have confidence in God? Yes. Can you expect God to fulfill his promises? Yes. Your experience tells you it's not possible. Other compromised Christians will tell you it's not necessary. Your doubts, your fears, your shame sound more loudly in your ear than the voice of God. Your feelings mislead you, but the Bible says, Psalm 138, verse 7, 78, the Lord will perfect that which concerns me. So I can be confident. God said it. He will do it. I have to trust him. I have to rely on the word and the word only to do just what the word says. You can have hope. You can rest upon the fact of God's word despite your feelings. You see, there's this uh, tagline that goes around often in 
conservative political circles, facts don't care about your feelings. But I'm here to tell you today that Bible facts do care about your feelings. The Bible acknowledges our condition and our experience, but the truth of the Bible can overcome your feelings and lead you to victory in Christ. You and I, we trace with crooked lines as we seek to imitate the perfect pattern of Christ. But God says, while we do this, we can be confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Many churches are discouraged with diminishing returns as they go forward to preach the everlasting gospel to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. They say to themselves, maybe we have to become more like the world to win the world. Maybe we have to be educated by worldly philosophy and methods on how to reach an ever-changing culture. Maybe we have to alter the faith once handed down to the saints to make it more acceptable in the eyes of a God-hating, sin-loving world. Or maybe we just need hope. Maybe we need some real confidence in the living God that what he promises he is also able to perform. Why can I have confidence that our churches will grow, thrive, prosper, and succeed? Because Jesus said, Matthew 16 and verse 18, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Do you realize how depressing the work of pastoral ministry would be if I didn't have that promise standing under me? Jesus said, I will build my church. And I say, thank you, Lord. We can have hope. If we follow Jesus, he will fulfill his promises. Maybe you're so perplexed, you look around at the church and you, 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 you feel that in, in, in various branches of the church throughout the world, there's compromise. There's a departure from the historic faith. And you're wondering, can we have hope? The answer is yes. You must trust in the promises of God. When you wrestle with the pain of loved ones, dear children that have departed from the faith, and you did your best to raise them in a godly Christian household, you have to have hope. You have to have confidence in God and confidence in his promises. And Peter today, he calls our hope a living hope because we have a living Father, a living Lord, and a living Spirit who are presently working in harmony to orchestrate validate and activate the fulfillment of their promises in our lives and in our churches. And Peter goes on to develop this thought further. He says that we're born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You see, we have a living hope because we have a living Savior. So we can praise God in a pandemic for the new life we have in Christ because our new life is validated and sustained because Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Jesus' resurrection is the central truth of the Christian faith because through being raised from the dead, God validated his rule in this earth. In 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4, Satan is called the God of this world, little g. Even Jesus himself, John chapter 12 and verse 31, John chapter 14, verse 30, Jesus himself referred to the devil as the ruler of this world. You see, under Satan's leadership, Jesus was condemned by the governments of this world and sentenced to death by crucifixion. Acts chapter 4, verses 26 and 27, the Bible says the kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. 
in raising Jesus from the dead, God overturned the decision of earthly governments and demonstrated the absolute supremacy of his universal rule. You see, Jesus was out of sync with the value system of this wicked world, but he lived in perfect conformity to God's Ten Commandment law. So the Jews had no jurisdiction over Christ. The Romans had no jurisdiction over Christ. The devil has no jurisdiction over Christ. Not even death has jurisdiction over Christ. So the grave could not hold him. Death, hell, and the grave came together as a legal team to prosecute a case against Christ. In the resurrection, God simply stepped in and said, you have no jurisdiction here. In validating his reign, God secured eternal life for all who believe. He validated his right to forgive sinners like you and me. He validated his right to impart to us his Holy Spirit to live inside of us and to change our hearts from rebellion to loyalty. He validated his right to preserve us in this world ready for his kingdom at the second coming of Jesus. And more than that, more than that, Jesus, as our resurrected Lord, sustains the new life that he gives. We are not saved simply by trusting in the fact that Jesus died and rose again. Catch that. A lot of Christians think they're saved by a fact. Many Christians think they, they are saved by an idea. We're not saved just by remembering and agreeing with the fact that Jesus died and rose again. Jesus is a living Savior. We are saved by trusting in the ever-living Jesus who died and rose again. Jesus is always present. You can talk to him. He sends his spirit. He sends his angels. He hears and answers your prayers. He is always speaking to you if only you would listen to his voice. Hebrews 7 and verse 25 says, Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. It's because Jesus is alive that we have a living hope. You're not just born again when you walk the aisle at the revival series and the preacher makes the call. But we must be renewed day after day by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Who is the one who is sending the Holy Spirit and pouring out the oil of grace? If not our high priest, Jesus Christ. Notice the present tense verbs in the following verses. Romans 8 verse 34. It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. We have a present tense God, a present tense Savior because he rose again. 1 John 2, 1, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Because we have a living Savior, we can come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Our new life is sustained day by day because our Lord lives. So Paul could say in 2 Corinthians 4 and 18 that the inward man is being renewed day by day. And Moses could speak to the children of Israel in Deuteronomy 33 and 25. As your days, so shall your strength be. Why? It's because Jesus lives. And having this hope, it's always pointing us in and pressing us forward. We can praise God in a pandemic because of the new life we have in Jesus. And this new life will ultimately climax on the day we receive our heavenly inheritance when Jesus comes. Peter says we're born again to an inheritance. And Peter tells us about our inheritance. Our inheritance in Christ, our birthright in Christ, it's a permanent inheritance. Peter says it's incorruptible. Bread molds. Produce rots. Clothes wear out. Cars break down. Buildings crumble, but not our heavenly inheritance. It will last for eternity. It will never decay, rust, or spoil. It won't be affected by a recession. It will never diminish in value. Our inheritance is a pure inheritance. It is undefiled. You see, our inheritance, it's virtuous in that it does not defile us. 
our heavenly inheritance does not encourage us to squander it away in wasteful living. So many Christians nowadays are so certain that they're going to heaven that they live like hell here on earth. But the security of our inheritance should motivate us to live righteously on this earth. We ought to be so heavenly minded that we accomplish the highest earthly good. Peter says, 2 Peter 3, 13 and 14, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. Our inheritance is also undefiled in the sense that it is verified. The word undefiled here in the original language speaks of a land title that is without defect. Our heavenly inheritance has a clear title. I want you to try to get a loan on a car that has a salvage title. But not our inheritance. It has a clear title. It's not flawed, and no court can take it away. Because the title is clear and clean, it's promised by the Father and put in writing through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, signed with the very blood of Jesus himself. Our inheritance is a pleasurable inheritance. As Peter says, it does not fade away. This phrase refers to the unending pleasures of the heavenly kingdom. The Bible speaks of the passing pleasures of sin, Hebrews 11 and verse 25. But the righteous pleasures we will enjoy in the heavenly kingdom will never end. They will not get boring, but will increase in intensity over time. When Jesus turned water into wine at a marriage feast and it was given to the host, the host drank and exclaimed, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. The Bible tells us in this way, Jesus manifested his glory. You see, only a Christian can truly say at all times and forevermore, the best is yet to come. This is God's way of saying it keeps getting better and better and better. Just when you thought you've seen it all, you haven't seen half. It fades not away. Our inheritance is a protected inheritance. It is reserved in heaven. To reserve means to guard, to protect, to keep safe. This inheritance is protected and kept safe. How many earthly inheritances have been stolen, lost by poor investment, bank failures, and mismanagement? People place their money in banks that are federally insured. They want their money to be government protected. Well, our heavenly inheritance is God protected. It's not federally insured. It's faithfully insured. The God who promised the inheritance protects our inheritance. And that's why Peter specifies who this inheritance is for. It is for those who are kept by the power of God through faith. You could say that the heavenly inheritance is reserved for those who are preserved. We are kept by the power of God. The Apostle Paul was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So we are kept in this world by the truth of the gospel. Paul writes, by grace you have been saved through faith. Peter writes that we are kept by the power of God through faith. So we can see that God's grace is his power to save. We often hear that God's grace is his unmerited favor, and that is one dimension of grace. But God's grace has three dimensions. Our salvation is 3D. Through grace, God declares us righteous on the basis of the perfectly sinless life of Jesus Christ. By grace, God also makes and keeps us righteous in the midst of a wicked world. Our thoughts, feelings, habits, and characters are changed by grace to reflect the image of the lovely Jesus. By grace, Christ will come again, claim us as his own, deliver us from this present evil world, and bountifully welcome us into his eternal kingdom. Thus, through Jesus, by grace, we are saved from the penalty, the power, and ultimately the very presence of sin. 
kept by the power of God through faith. Saved by grace through faith. Faith. Why is that important? God's grace is powerful enough to save anybody. You ought to know that. That's why as Christians, we don't look down on anybody. We don't keep anybody out or away. Because if God's grace couldn't save anybody, it couldn't save you. Couldn't save me. But the Bible wants us to know that this grace is accessed through faith. Our access into God's multidimensional grace is through faith and faith alone. God does not choose to be gracious towards us sinners because we work and prove ourselves to him. Our actions are not currency that we can exchange for God's favor. We can only access God's grace through faith. But in saying that, let's not sell faith short. Faith is not just words. Faith is not just an idea. Faith is submitting your will to Jesus. Faith is yielding your heart to Jesus, fixing your affections upon Jesus. Faith is devotion to Jesus. Faith is covenant loyalty with Jesus. And as we exercise this faith, we will be kept by the power of God. He tells us we're kept by the power of God through faith for salvation. That is, God is preserving you and me until our ultimate deliverance when Jesus comes again and receives us into himself. This deliverance, Peter says, is ready to be revealed. Have you ever considered that God is more willing to send Jesus to come get us than we are willing to have him come? He's more excited about the second coming than we are, brothers and sisters. We often look forward to the second coming in reference to ourselves. I hear people say, I just can't wait for Jesus to come and save me from fill in the blank with your unfavorable life experience. These bills, these pressures, the trials in, in the church, the trials in the world. But, but please understand this. Sin, death, every cry of human suffering rips God's heart apart with grief that we couldn't begin to understand. Jesus' agony when he was dying on the cross shows to our little minds a picture of of the agony that the Godhead has suffered ever since sin was first introduced into his universe. And God continues to suffer until the plan of salvation is complete, until his government is vindicated, until even the most hardened sinner has seen enough evidence of love and truth to expose Satan for the fraud that he is, until God can justify his right to execute rebels who completely refuse to respond to his offer of mercy, until it is seen as it is said in Philippians 2 and verse 11, that Jesus Christ is Lord by every created intelligence to the glory of God the Father. God suffers. So our salvation, our final deliverance, it's ready to be revealed. He's ready to come get us. We can praise God. And he says it's ready to be revealed when? What does it say? In the last time. Our ultimate final salvation will be revealed in the last time. Guess what, brothers and sisters? We're in the last time. We are well into the period of Earth's history marked by Jesus' declaration in Revelation 10, verse 6. There should be time no longer. That is, we've reached the end of prophetic time. It is in this time that Jesus declared the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. The 2300 days of Daniel 8:14 have come to an end. Revelation 14:7, we know that the hour of his judgment has come. We are in the last time. You could say in a very real sense that we are not waiting for Jesus to come, but that God is waiting for his church to prepare the world for Jesus' coming. God is patiently waiting. None of us knows how much longer he will wait. The Bible tells us 2 Peter 3 verse 9 he is long-suffering toward us. Can you say amen? Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 
James tells us, chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. God is waiting for us, you and me, to be ready to receive his Holy Spirit in latter rain proportion. It's at that time that Jesus says in Matthew 24 and verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So what are we waiting for, church? We can praise God in a pandemic. We can praise God through pain. We can pay, praise God through problems. Why? Because if we trust in Jesus today, we receive new life in him. And that new life is more real than what we feel in our hearts at times, what our doubts tempt us to think. So what are we waiting for? Let us praise God. Let us give him the praise of our lips. Let us give him the praise of our lives. Let us give him the praise of our love for each other and for those in our community who do not know Jesus Christ as Lord. If you're listening to me today and you haven't come to believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior, it's utterly impossible for you to experience this joy and this confidence at the highest level. I invite you right now in your heart and your seat, come to Jesus. I know listening to me right now, there's a child. The faith of your parents has not become your faith. You can come to him right now. Jesus, I want to know what it means to praise you above all the problems of life. Anyone who's under the sound of my voice, anyone who is under the sound of my voice that believes in Jesus, yet you find yourself soaked with tears of depression under a storm cloud of negativity. Jesus is calling you today. He's calling you to a deeper repentance. He's calling you, he's calling me to repent of our forgetfulness of his many benefits. He's calling us to examine our lives. Are we revealing the blessings of enjoying new life in Jesus by faith? Therein often lies the root of why we can be hampered down by strong negative emotions. Jesus is calling you to remember today that the sunshine of God's love, even if it's temporarily hidden by depressing clouds of circumstance, it's there shining. Will you recommit to abiding in Jesus today? God will reveal his glory to this world through his last day people. He will reveal himself to this world as we continue to find reasons to praise him in the face of of the most formidable opposition and difficulty. So what are we waiting for? Jesus is waiting for you today. Can we arise and sing today hymn number 289 as the deacon comes forward and the musicians come forward? The Savior is waiting. He's waiting for you. He's waiting for me today to make a choice that whatever your experience has been heretofore, you will trust him today.
softly in the background as we give the benediction. As Elder Mills said, I was raised in a Baptist household. So we make calls every time we present the word of God. If there's someone who says, I want to trust Jesus and I want to come, we're here to pray for you today. I know we are in common company, church members. If there's someone today who says, I want to recommit myself to Jesus, we're just going to offer a short space for you to come forward. Do you have a difficulty in life that you want to bring to the altar of God? My dear brother, come on down. Praise God. Hallelujah. This is the time. Worship is not complete if we don't respond to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So as the music plays, a lot of Holy Spirit to speak to you. When you come down front in the presence of the church, what you're doing is acknowledging publicly, I need Jesus. I want Jesus. I choose Jesus. If you need to do that in any way, now's your time. God knows your heart. He knows what you're saying to him. He knows what you're asking of him. And now, as brothers and sisters in the faith, we can support and love one another, even more so as we see those among us standing up saying, I need Jesus. Help me, Lord Jesus. Save me, Lord Jesus. Bring the burdens of your heart to Christ. Even if you carry an intercessory burden on behalf of another, feel free to bring them up front in your heart, in your prayers. Just take a moment to talk to Jesus for yourself. You tell him what you need. You tell him why it is you came forward today. He knows and he's ready to receive you. Continue to pray silently in your heart as I pray aloud. Father in heaven, your word has gone forth. And I pray that my efforts to be adequate in explaining the truth will be mixed with the incense of Christ's righteousness that it may be acceptable. I ask that my efforts, and please, Lord, will be empowered and backed up by your Holy Spirit to actually make the word effective. There's only one who really teaches us. May your Holy Spirit rain down on us right now. Lead us to a renewed repentance, a renewed confession of our unworthiness, and our unlikeness to Christ, lead us right now to a recommitment, a renewing of that faith that you birthed in our hearts through your love. May Jesus be all and in all. Lord, you know the responses. Father, as your people in this world, help us to abide in you and help us to know, not just by theory, but by experience, that we are kept moment by moment, by your power through faith. Lord, shine light into the darkness. If there is negativity, bitterness, depression in someone's heart, their life, their marriage, their home, their workplace, wherever it may rear its ugly head, shine your light. Your word tells us the light shines in the darkness and the darkness could not overcome it. Do that for us today. And we're so thankful that we know you're more willing to give good gifts unto us than parents are to give good gifts to their children. Father, may this moment be a capsule in time of a future of us working together as your churches in this world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Now unto him who is able to to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we may ask or think according to the power that works in us. To the glory of God in Jesus Christ for the church now and forevermore. Let the church of God say, Amen. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters.